Welcome, everyone. Today with us, we have an amazing speaker, Dr. Alex Filipenko. Alex is a professor of astronomy at UC Berkeley. He has got his PhD from Caltech and then became first a Hertz Foundation Fellow and then a Miller Fellow at UC Berkeley. He has won a number of prizes throughout his career, the most noteworthy so far, the 2015 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics that he shared with Dr. Adam Rees, Dr. Brian Schmidt, and the whole high redshift supernova search team. Alex not only is an amazing scientist, he's also a great outreach communicator, and he is famously known for being part of the History Channel series, The Universe. So, are you ready with your popcorns? Let's get started. Thank you so much for being with us today, Alex. Tell me, how did you end up in your research field in astronomy in general, and maybe more particularly in your uh, specific research field? Well, I'd been interested in science my whole life, but it was mostly chemistry from ages 10 through 17. But, you know, when I was a freshman in high school, my parents got me a small telescope and the third bright star I looked at turned out to be Saturn. So that knocked my socks off. I discovered Saturn that evening. No one told me to look at that particular star. But, uh, you know, that began this great interest in astronomy although chemistry was still my main interest. And then in college, my interest shifted even more to astronomy and physics. And uh, so I switched from chemistry to, to astrophysics. I also made small quantities of explosives and they went off in my face. <laughs> and so if for no reason other than a sense of self-preservation, I felt that I had to get out of chemistry, okay. <laughs> One of my specific fields of study are exploding stars, like in my background here. And that came about because after I finished my PhD thesis, I was still gathering data for an extension of that thesis. And I was studying the centers of galaxies, looking for supermassive black holes inside them. And one of the galaxies that my former advisor and I pointed to had an extra bright star in it. And we took a spectrum of that star and it turned out to be an exploding star. So I had discovered a supernova and it was a weird new type of supernova. So that just changed my career from supermassive black holes and active galaxies, which I'm still interested in, but also <laughs> then switching over to exploding stars, which have consumed much of my career as well. You said you are interested in uh, exploding stars, but can you describe uh, in simplest way what you look for? for these? Why, is, why are they so interesting? They create during the explosion and eject into space the very elements of which we are made. The carbon in our cells, the oxygen that we breathe, the calcium in our bones, the iron in our red blood cells. All these elements are cooked up through nuclear reactions deep inside stars. But if some of those stars were not to explode, then those elements would either not be made or would remain deep inside the star, not available for the formation of new stars, planets, and ultimately life. So in a sense, by studying exploding stars, we study our very origins. And to me, that is quite exciting. For the viewers, uh, should we worry that our sun is going to explode anytime soon? <laughs> no, no. Our sun in four or five billion years will grow to become a red giant and mm. earth will be fried, but relatively <laughs> slowly. It's not going to be a single explosive event. If, if it does explode, you can fire astrophysicists like me who claim that it won't explode. But at that point, being fired from the university will be the least of my worries. Yeah. <laughs> so you have a fantastic career. Do you have one discovery that happened throughout your career that you remember like the most amazing thing that happened? The discovery along with my postdoctoral scholar, Adam Reese, of the accelerating expansion of the universe. We looked at these exploding stars and by uh, measuring how bright they appear to be and knowing how powerful they really are, you can figure out how far away they are and you can measure how quickly they're moving away from us. So by doing these measurements for exploding stars at a range of distances, you get an exploration of the past history of the expansion of the universe. And the weird thing is 
that it's expanding faster now than it was four or five billion years ago. So that's very, very strange because normal gravity always slows things down. It always pulls, it doesn't push. So this leads to the idea of dark energy, of a repulsive nature, accelerating the expansion of our universe. Do you have any favorite part of your job as well as maybe not so favorite one? I really love to observe. I love gathering photons. As my former advisor, Wall Sargent at Caltech would say, the simple act of gathering photons. The part I dislike is writing grant proposals and <laughs> sitting on committees. <laughs> I, I assume you do a lot of that, unfortunately. Yeah, that's right. Especially when you have a lot of students and postdocs, that's a bunch of hungry mouths to feed. So you have to somehow come up with their salary. You have done a lot of outreach and successfully so, but what is the question usually that non-astronomer ask you? It would probably be what my thoughts are on life elsewhere in the universe. Uh, I think people are intensely interested in Earth possibly having or possibly not having the, the only life in our galaxy or, or maybe even in the observable universe. I see. And what's your answer usually? It's, it's complicated. You know, microbial life might be quite common, although even that we're not sure. But I, I actually think that intelligence at our level and mechanical ability at our level is quite rare. For example, there have been more than 10 billion species of life on Earth over the history of Earth. And nothing, as far as we can tell, has reached our level of intelligence or mechanical ability. Moreover, we're relatively late in the development of life on Earth. For most of the history of life on Earth, we didn't exist. Uh, thirdly, we are not a clear long-term evolutionary advantage, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, we have improved the lives of hundreds of millions of people on Earth, but we're also the first species that can and possibly will destroy ourselves. Finally, you know, if they're common out there, then you get into the Fermi paradox. Where are they if they're that common? Why aren't they already here? And mm -hmm. I think that the UFO reports just don't quite clear the standards that we demand of science, you know. Mm -hmm. So all those reasons make me think that intelligence at our level is quite rare, although I don't think we're unique. If there is any stigma or myth associated with the role of astronomers that you've heard of or think there is? There's a very obvious one. Many people think that astronomers are astrologers. Yeah. <laughs> Astronomy and astrology had a common root, common origins, but they've bifurcated into two very distinct fields of human endeavor. I am not an astrologer, okay? <laughs> and so, you know, Sometimes I say, well, I'm an astrophysicist, but then th that's a longer word and it sounds a little bit more pretentious. <laughs> so I, I prefer to say I'm an astronomer, even though I'm an astrophysicist. Uh, but the, the, the pr trouble of saying that I'm an astronomer is that some people will think that I can tell their future or something like that. So. <laughs> Do you have any advice for somebody that may be interested in pursuing this field? We all know it's a very com difficult field. Yeah. What advice would you give? The advice I would give is to constantly be on the lookout for opportunities and take advantage of them when they fall in your lap. So, for example, going back to the supernova that I discovered uh, quite by accident, you know, I was at that time interested in a different scientific problem, but I discovered the supernova and it was an interesting supernova. And I took advantage of this opportunity and, and became an expert on exploding stars. And that led me to cosmology and studying the expansion history of the universe. And that night I had a hundred possible galaxies to observe in the last hour of the night. Only two could have been observed half an hour each. And I just happened to choose this one. It was complete luck. Wonderful. But I was prepared for the opportunity. I took advantage of it. This is a fantastic advice. To finish up, in one line, can you encourage somebody to take up astronomy? We are made of star stuff. Doesn't that grab you? <laughs> fantastic. Here, here's another one. You know, as an astronomer, you have the whole universe to explore. 
It was lovely to have you for our interview. Thank you so much for all the wonderful things you've said. It's, uh, it's amazing to talk to somebody like you. <laughs> well, thank you. The pleasure was mine.